let's look at the practical aspect of torques. Specifically, let's figure out how to calculate them. Let's imagine that we have a particular system where a force F1 is being applied and let's say a force F2 and then a force F3. Let's imagine that we know the magnitude of all those forces and we know the dimension of our little box. And I would like to calculate the torque of each force about, let's say, point A. Remember, the torque of, say, force F3 about point A is very different from the torque of F3 about, say, point C, because the R vector will be different. So whenever you calculate torque, you always have to specify about which point you calculate that torque about. Which usually refers to the axial rotation, which is at that particular point, perpendicular in this case to the plane, when you're dealing, dealing with two-dimensional uh, problems. And again, it only matters which point you pick if your system is not at equilibrium. So, let's calculate the torque. Let's call it 1 which is due to the force F1 about point A. Therefore, we need to first allocate R1. Remember that by definition, R1 is the position vector that will start at the point about which we're going to calculate the torque all the way up to where the force is applied. In this particular case, F1 is applied right here. Therefore, R1 must be from here to here. So, how are we going to calculate the cross product of R1 and F1? Well, we will need some angles. So, let's imagine that we know this angle as alpha. There are several ways to do it. There are actually three ways. Let's go over the three different methods for F1. <coughs> let's redraw this carefully. R1. and F1. First method. Remember that the cross product is zero if R is parallel to F and it will reach its maximum value if R is perpendicular to F, which is directly from the properties of a cross product. So the first method that we can do is calculate the perpendicular component of the position vector with respect to the force. So for us to be able to do this, we need to draw the line of action of the force. And what we will do is we will decompose our position vector R1 into two vectors, one being perpendicular to F1, the other one being parallel. We've done that hundreds of times. So in this case, it's easy, R1 perpendicular will be this one, and R1 parallel to the force will be this one. Therefore, we can rewrite this as R1 perpendicular plus R1 parallel cross F1. Let's expand this. We have R1 perpendicular cross F1 plus R1 parallel cross F1. Now we know from geometry, since we have decomposed R1 as one component perpendicular and the other one parallel to our force F1, that this term is obviously zero because R1 is parallel to F1. Therefore, the only term that will do some torque or the only term that will contribute to the magnitude of the torque is going to be this one. F1 is given, R1 is given, therefore, really what we need is to obtain this vector. If we know alpha, then obviously this will be R1 cosine alpha times F1 in this particular case, in magnitude. So 
So the torque due to the force F1 is equal in magnitude as uh, to R1 cosine alpha F1. The direction is, in this particular case, clockwise, therefore negative. Now technically, if we put a negative sign, we refer to its direction. Therefore, I need to take out this, whoops, this, and this will be along a unit vector such that E is perpendicular to the board. OK? So that was the first method. The second method is to, let's keep everything above, to start from here. But this time, I'm going to redraw R1 and F1. I'm going to start with the same starting point. The torque due to F1 about A is equal to R1 cross F1. But this time, instead of obtaining the parallel and the perpendicular component of the position vector R with respect to the force, we will focus on the force first. Therefore, we are going to try to figure out the perpendicular and the parallel component of, of the force with respect to the position vector. Therefore, our reference is going to be R1. And we would like the component of F1, which is perpendicular and parallel to R1. So instead of decomposing R1, we are going to decompose F1. So let's decompose F1 into two vectors, one perpendicular to the direction of R1. Let's call this F1 perpendicular and another one which is parallel, F1 parallel. The same exact way as we decompose R1. So we can rewrite this as R1 cross F1 parallel plus F1 perpendicular. We can expand this. This will give me R1 cross F1 parallel plus R1 cross F1 perpendicular. And similarly, the F1 parallel will give me zero torque because it's parallel to R1. Therefore, this is zero. Again, because R1 is parallel to F1 parallel. So the only term that will contribute to the torque is this one. So we need to figure out what this is. Let's recall that this was our alpha. So this is our right angle triangle. And we need to figure out whether alpha is this one or this angle. Obviously, this line is perpendicular to that line. This one is perpendicular to that one. Therefore, this is our alpha. Which means that F1 perpendicular is nothing else than F1 cosine alpha times R1. Again, this is going clockwise, therefore it's negative in a vector direction which is perpendicular to both R1 and F1. So obviously we end up with the same results, uh, which is good. <laughs> Okay, now third method. The third method is quite useful, especially if you go into 3D, because in 3D, you're not going to have one vector between your position. Uh, I'm sorry. In 3D, you're not going to deal with one angle between your position vector and your force. You're going to be dealing with three angles, which are called cosine angles. Yeah, I'm not sure why cosine angles, whatever. But, you know, instead of one, you just have three. Uh, so if you like to figure out the component of each vector force with respect to the position vector or vice versa, uh, it might be difficult to figure out which one is clockwise, clockwise, which one is counterclockwise, which angle you have to consider, because now you have three. Uh, it becomes much more uh, complicated. So a way to go around this is to use a third technique, which is called the matrix and the determinant, which also can be used in 2D. Now in 2D, some people might think that it's 
you know big machinery it's overkilled uh, some other people might argue that if you get used to it in 2d as you switch to 3d the transition would be easier and then uh, it would be easier when you deal to with torque in 3d so try each method figure out figure out the one you like the best and then uh, pick one if you intend to uh, do more torque in three dimensions especially if you go into civil engineering or mechanical engineering i would suggest that you master these two methods just you know for fun to uh, do it fast whenever the system is easy and to also master the third one which is the one we're going to go over right now the idea is very simple if you have a cross b Remember that this can be expressed as I, J, K, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, B, X, B, Y, B, Z. Bang, done. And all you have to do is calculate the determinant. In this case, you will end up with three terms, I, J, and K. So the first term, I, will be the determinant of the matrix 2 by 2 this one the j component would be in the negative of this external matrix and the k component will be the determinant of this two by two matrix so let's apply this analogy to our case we would like to compute r1 cross f1 so i j Okay, all we need is R1x. R1x will be, according to my figure, R1 cosine alpha. Assuming that we use the standard Kronig system like this. R1 cosine alpha. The y component will be R1 sine alpha. There is no k component, 0. Then we're going to put f1x, f1y, and fyz. f1x is obviously 0. f1j is, according to this, minus f1. And the k is 0. If you're dealing with 2D, you know that the i and j component will give you 0 because of those two terms. The only one that will survive is k which is the exact same one as I called E, same thing. And in this case, I use the fish method, this times this, minus this times this. So I end up with minus F1, R1, cosine theta. Alpha, sorry. Now the advantage of this method is, now obviously it's the same, but the biggest advantage of this method is the sign is given to us automatically. So we don't have to think about which one is clockwise which one is counterclockwise uh, we just set up the component of each position vector each force and then the determinant will give us the correct direction so if we see a negative sign we know that this torque is clockwise if we had positive f1 r1 cosine alpha then we would know that the torque is counterclockwise so we can do the exact same thing with f2 Let's say this is beta and this is gamma. Let's use the matrix. R2 cross F2. Same, we'll use I, J, K. We need R2. R2 again is defined as the position vector from the point about which you calculate the torque all the way up to where the force is applied. This is my R2. R2 has only an X component, so that's easy. R2, 0, 0. And F2 is this vector here, which again can be moved over here, because remember it's a vector. So this vector beta is the same as this vector, I mean angle, I'm sorry. This angle beta is the same as this one. Therefore, we can express is x and y component easily. The x is f2 cosine beta. The y is f2 sine beta. Both are positive. f2 cosine beta. f2 sine beta. 0. 
Now we calculate the determinant about k, which is going to be r2 times f2 sine beta minus 0 times blah blah, which is still 0. So this will give us f2 r2 sine beta. The sine is positive, therefore we know that the torque created by f2 about point A is counterclockwise. Let's check. Obviously, yep. If the level arm is here, the force is here, the whole thing will tend to go that way. What about the last one? The last one for us to figure out the torque of F3 about A, we need R3. R3 again starts where we calculate the torque about, which is A, all the way up to where F3 is applied. Obviously, this torque will be going clockwise, therefore we expect a negative sign. Let's check. R3 cross F3 will give us IJK. What is R3? R3 is in the y direction, therefore R3x is 0. R3 is positive in the J and 0 again. And F3 in my particular case is similar to F2. F3 cosine gamma. F3 sine gamma, 0, and therefore the torque is this times this minus this times this minus R3 F3 cosine gamma. And again, we end up with a negative sign, which we knew from observation. So you have noticed that sometimes it's cosine, sometimes it's sine. So usually people, sometimes people define the torque as R cross F, which is R F sine theta in magnitude. This is fine, but if you like to memorize this, you need to remember that this angle theta is the angle between R and F. Sometimes you will be given this angle, but sometimes you might be given this angle. So if that's the case, either you did use this one to be able to use this relationship if you figure out the magnitude, or you know just stick to the matrix method or draw a little picture. Uh, you don't have to memorize which one is the cosine or if you have to use the sine or blah, blah, blah. Just project all your vectors, do it carefully, and then you cannot go wrong. Okay, so those were the three methods to calculate the torque. Again, make sure you are confident with all of them. Which one are you gonna use? The first one or the second one? Well, it depends. It depends what the problem is giving you. So sometimes it will be easier to use this one. And sometimes in a particular uh, problem, it will be much easier to use that one. Or you can always use this one regardless of what the problem is. Now, the advantage of this matrix, again, is that it will be easier when you go to 3D. It also avoid the mistakes of forgetting a term. Sometimes as you decompose your vector f in a direction parallel and perpendicular to r, there will be a component of f which will give maybe a clockwise component of the torque, and then the other component of f which might give a counterclockwise component of the torque. So you might have two components of the torques. Now you have to figure out which one is positive, which one is negative, and more importantly, you cannot just forget one of the two. The advantage of the torque is if you have such situation, it means that here you might have a non-zero component. You might have R2 cosine blah blah, R2 sine blah blah, and by doing this you will pick up this component of the torque, which is positive, and then this one, which will be in this case negative. Both might be positive, both might be negative, one might be positive, the other one might be negative. If you set up the matrix, you can never go wrong. By just calculating the determinant, you will pick up the sign accordingly. If you're using the first two methods, you're going to have to be very careful in trying to visualize you know, which part of the component does give you a positive, which one does give you a negative. So practice all of them so that you have a backup system.